Oh, the deep, deep love of Jesus could not be more true, could not be more real and necessary in this world and the world to come. We get it. We understand the love of the Father is the kind of love which we've never ever imagined. It's the kind of love that contemplates you. It's the kind of love that clothes you. It's the kind of love that cares for you. We know that God is love. First John says, right? God is love. He said that he who abides in me is love. For God is love. Jesus said in John 17, I ask that you protect them from the evil one. In Romans chapter 8, it talks about the kind of love which cannot be separated. But to understand God's love, we must go to the Bible and uncover what it really means. According to the scripture, they are two kinds of love. The Bible mentions a love that is general for all mankind. But the Bible also mentions love for his own. There is a kind of love which you've never ever imagined before. This kind of love is a love for his own that is so deep, that is so caring, that is so special, that is so covenant. Let's uncover that together. These two kinds of love. Let us first define love according to the Bible. According to the Bible, biblical love is this general love. God has a general love for mankind. Someone once said to me, well, th th does God break character? Does God hate when he sends people to hell? No, God is love when he sends people to hell. God is still love because God never changes. He's always the same. But there are two kinds of love in the Bible. There is um, there is a common love. He loves general love for everybody. And there's a certain kind of covenant love. He loves for his own. Let's look at the biblical love. And I challenge you to turn your Bible to Genesis chapter 4. And in Genesis chapter 4, we see a common love. Let me read you those verses. Now the man had relations with his wife Eve, and she conceived and gave birth to Cain. And said, I've gotten a man-child with the help of the Lord. That's love. That's love. Because it was actually before the curse. Before the curse. That God said, be fruitful and multiply. And then after the curse, Genesis chapter 4, God allowed Eve to produce a child. And it says here that she conceived and gave birth to Cain. And says, I've gotten a man child with what? The help of the Lord. That's love. That God still, after the curse, allows mankind to multiply. In fact, down the verse, later on in the chapter, it says that uh, Cain had a son, Cain got married, had a son, and they had kids, and Lamech had wives, and it keeps going on, it keeps going down and down a list, and it talks about Seth, and talks about the family line, it's, and it keeps repeating itself over and over again, and talking about the family relations, talking about the sexual relations, and the family tree, keep on multiplying the earth. That's love. Because... Right after God says, in the day you eat, you die. Genesis chapter 5 says that Adam lived to be 130 years old. Seth was lived for 800 years. God says, in the day you eat, you die, but then you live 800 years. That's love. You know, when you think about love, we... We sort of have a misconception. We sort of think that love is, you know, a nandy pamby kind of thing. No, but love, 
love is every single day. God says, love your enemies. Love your enemies like he has done. God loves his enemies. God allows people who are enemies with him to live and to have a life and to eat food. Paul says, God is good. God gives crops to you in your seasons and rain and sunshine. So God does love his enemies. And God commands for all of us to do the same. In Matthew chapter 5 verse 44 mentions love, mentions this love of loving your enemies through, through man's wickedness and through man's disobedience he eventually had to flood the earth but before that God was patiently long suffering but Matthew chapter 5 verse 44 mentions this kind of love for enemies it says this you've heard that it was said you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy Verse 44, but I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute, you, who persecute you, so that you may be the sons of your Father who is in heaven. For he causes the sun to rise to the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and on the unrighteous. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. He talks about the good Samaritan. Who loved his enemies. Christ loved his enemies. He proved that, right? He prayed for them, in fact. He prayed for them. In Matthew, or actually in John, he mentions that Jesus washed the feet of his disciples. And one of those disciples were who? Judas. Jesus loves his enemies. In fact, it says that, it says that um, while we were what? Enemies with God, Christ died for us. So we are commanded to love our enemies as Christ loves his enemies and gives him every and gives him every single day a fresh breath of air. God did not die for us, God did not care for us while we were repenting, God did not care for us while we were um loving him. God cared for us and died for us while we we were enemies. He died for us. And that love is displayed in Jesus Christ with Judas Iscariot. In Matthew chapter 26, verse 50, Jesus makes an interesting, very, very, um, very groundbreaking claim to Judas Iscariot in Matthew chapter 26, verse 50. Actually, shocking. First of all, it was shocking that Judas betrayed Jesus, but it was also shocking what followed Jesus' mouth. After, in fact, Jesus tre treated Judas no different than any of their other disciples. That's why when the that's why when Jesus said, the, "I have one of you who is going to betray me," the mm -hmm. disciples never mm -hmm. ever doubted or questioned if it was Judas or not because Jesus loved Judas exactly how he loved all the other ones. Treated everyone. This is a kind of general love. But Matthew chapter twenty six verse fifty. This is the this is the this is the this is the, this is the general love Jesus has on the, on for everybody. Immediately, Judas went to Jesus and said, "Hail, Rabbi!" and kissed him. This is the night of Jesus' betrayal. Judas walked up to Jesus and kissed him. And Jesus said to him, "Friend, do what you have come for. Do you betray me with a kiss?" Jesus said to him, friend, friend. A rabbi has a student. Jesus is the rabbi and his student is his friend. Jesus says, friend, do what you come for. Do you betray me with a kiss? After Jesus poured his life into Judas, after Jesus was constantly caring for Judas, Judas betrayed Jesus Christ. And Jesus, after all that, turns to Judas and calls him friend. This is the kind of general love that Jesus has for the world. John chapter 3 verse 16 says that G for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. So there is a kind of general love that Jesus does have. But remember, the it is 
to a certain extent. It is not unlimited love. John chapter 15 verse 13 says that no greater love has for thee that he lays down his life for his friends. Right? No greater love. Second Peter chapter 3 verse 9, while we were hostile enemies with God, Christ gave his life for us. So there is a general love that God does have even for his enemies. The Bible says, Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God, knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, because God is love. Psalms, the psalmist says, Your mercy endureth forever. Your loving kindness never fails. So that is a general love. But I want you to know that there is a love for his own, for his sheep. And this kind of love is, 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 uh, is unlimited and exploding. This is a kind of love that, that is ridiculous. This is, this is what Jesus Christ is to his own. While it is true that Jesus does love his enemies to a certain extent, this love that he has for believers is unlimited, unmatched, unparalleled, and it has a written covenant, a guarantee, sealed by the Holy Spirit, written in the Holy Scriptures. This love is unbreakable. And I challenge you to take your Bibles to Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6. Well, it is true that God does have love, but God has a more God has an affectionate love for his own. And remember, when Jesus was on earth, he turned to Peter and, th- and three times he turned to Peter and said, Peter, do you love me? But let's look at Matthew chapter six. Matthew chapter six. And this is th- th- this demonstrates God's love for his own. And we're very familiar with the passage. You don't need to turn there if you know it already. In verse 8, actually in Luke, it says that some were standing by and said, Lord, teach us to pray. And so we find ourselves in Matthew chapter 6, verse 9. Jesus turned to them and says, Pray then in this way. Our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we also have forgiven our debtors. And do not lead us into into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Now now you might ask yourself, well, how does God's love is displayed in this prayer? This prayer from you to God, how does it display God's love? Well, in every way. In every way. This prayer... Right here, puts God's love on full display. Full display. This is God's unbreakable bond with his covenant people. Verse 9 says, Our Father who is in heaven. Our Father. The unbelievers do not have a father. The unbelievers have one father, the devil. We have the Father who the Father, God. To call God Father is not only, watch this, it's not putting, it's not, um, it's exalting God, but is but it is a kind of an, it's, a, it's an affection. This is an affectionate word, Father. In the, in the literal Hebrew, it says Abba. Abba. In fact, the first words a Jewish boy or a Jewish girl ever spoke was either Abba and what? Ima. So Abba is an affectionate word. When Jesus was sobbing in the garden, he said, Father, take this cup from me. It's an affectionate word, Father. To call God Father is a, is a loving way. Your Father cares for you, protects you, feeds you. To say that, to say that God is your Father means that he has un, unlimited love for you. And really, this word is only meant for the Christian. Only meant for the Christian. Father, 
Father is a word only meant for the Christians. It's a kind of an affectionate love. It's a love which we've never heard before. It's a love that will wipe away every tear from your eye. It's a love that in my Father's house are many mansions. This kind of love is crazy. It's unlimited and ex- and it's reached only to those who believe. Our Father who is in heaven, hallowed or holy is your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done. Father, whatever it is you have, I want to give to you. Your will be done on earth as it is, as it is in heaven. Watch this. This is, this is God's love um, reached out to, his, to the people who, whom he loves. Give us this day our daily bread. That's not, we're not asking, we're not telling God to do that. God already promised he would do that. Remember, God says, my God will supply all of your needs according to the richness of Christ Jesus. Remember that? Do not worry what you shall eat, what you shall wear, how much more are you worth than your Father who is in heaven. You're worth more than the flowers. You're worth more than the birds, and your Father in Heaven cares for those. How much more will your Father in Heaven care for what? For you, the believer. So your Father in Heaven will give you your daily bread. Verse 12, these are already, by the way, this prayer is just already promises that God has for the believer. Verse 12, the next promise. So not only will God love you, not only will God care for you, not only will God give you your daily needs, not only will God give you your daily food. Verse 12, we, this is the most important one of all. Forgive us our debts. God will forgive your debts. Remember in Isaiah, God will carry away all your iniquities. Isaiah said, you remember that? By his stripes we are healed. That's a promise to believers, to the covenant people of God. He will forgive us our debts. Peter asked God, how many times can we forgive? God says, not seven times, but seven times seventy. In other words, an unlimited amount. How much more, if you forgive others, will the Father forgive you? Because he loves his own. Father said to my sheep, hear my voice. And I call to them. This is a love that's forgiving, that is stable, unbreakable, that's never ending, unlimited, but limited to the people whom he has chosen to love. This is a love for his own, which cannot be matched for his sheep. My sheep hear my voice. He for Jesus forgives his enemies. He forgives. He forgives the ones he loves. Just amazing stuff. And he says, For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. So be it. Amen. So this love is unmatched. It's unparalleled. It's un- It's resolutionary. It's stable. Someone said, oh, are you scared of God? Are you are you terrified of God? No, I'm not scared of God. I have no reason to be scared of God at all. We all know God loves his children. We are sons of light because God's our father. In fact, perfect love cast out that fear. There is no fear when I stand before God because I know God is my father and he loves his own. To the very end. And remember in Romans chapter 8. Paul's objection was. Christians in court um, below God. Paul's objection was Satan's attack against Christianity. Remember that? This is God's love and full display. Paul's defense is Satan. Remember when Satan comes up to the Christian and condemns them. He condemns them. Remember Joshua? Satan walks up to Job and says, and tries to condemn him. Job loved you for nothing. Has Pastor Thompson loved you for nothing? Has Pastor John Wesley loved you for nothing, God? 
accusatory. Satan accuses, Satan's all, all, all the time constantly accusing Christ, his own sheep. Cain's all the time trying to attack, attack, condemn, and condemn. And finally, in Romans chapter 8, Paul has to yell and say, Therefore, there is no condemnation for those who are in what? Christ Jesus. God indeed loves his own. He loves his own. This unbreakable bond is something special. And Paul mentions it too. Paul does say, For there are neither no angel, nor death, nor life that can separate you Verse 31, what shall we say then to these things of God is for us who is against us? He who did not spare his own son but delivered him for us all, how will he not also give him freely give us all things? Who will bring a charge against God's elect? God is the one who justifies. Who is the one who condemns Christ Jesus as he who died? Yes, rather who was raised, who at the right hand of God? Who will separate us from the love of God? Will tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword, just as it is written? For in all these things we overwhelmingly conquer, though, him who loved us. Verse 38. For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor Satan, nor angels, nor, principal, nor, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, or anything created below, will be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. This is a love that's unbreakable. Isaiah chapter 54, you have to go to the Old Testament to fully understand this kind of love. In Isaiah chapter 54, verse 10, he mentioned, this is very, um, hang on here. Isaiah chapter 54, verse 10 mentions a kind of love which we should not overlook. For the mountain may be removed and the hills may shake, but my loving kindness will be not removed from you. For my covenant of peace will not be shaken, says the Lord who has compassion on you. God has love that is everlasting, unbreakable, and goes on for forever and ever and ever and ever ends. We see that when Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for his own. Galatians chapter 2, verse 20 continues on the line. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. In the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. So this is a kind of love which you've never heard of. This is a kind of love that's unbreakable. It should never be despised, overlooked, or understood. And you remember 11, chapter 11, verse 33 of John, it mentions that Jesus cried, cried. He said, when Jesus therefore saw her weeping, the Jews who came here were also weeping. He was deeply moved in spirit and said, where have you laid him? Jesus wept. Verse 35 he wept, not because of Lazarus dying. Jesus wept not because of the death of Lazarus. Jesus wept because he saw what the results of sin brought. The results of sin. So sad. In Ezekiel chapter 16, we get this covenant love which God promised to his own. Ezekiel chapter 16 says this Then the word of the Lord came to me saying Son of man make known to Jerusalem her abominations This is Israel in judgment And thus says your thus says the Lord go to Jerusalem your origin and your birth are from the land of Canaanite Your father was an Ammonite and your mother a Hittite it's basically a Canaanite origin and verse 4, here we have the, the origin of Israel. Jesus, or God in this case, calling his own. Calling his own, verse 4. He chooses his own, verse 4. 
As for your birth, on the day you were born, your navel cord was not cut, nor were you washed with water for cleansing. You were not robed with salt, even wrapped in cloths. When people were born in the ancient world, and even today, they cleanse them with, with uh, they sanitize them with salt and wrap them in linen. But as for Israel, when Israel was born, they were naked. They did not have a father or anyone to care for them. Verse 5. No I looked with pity on you to do any of these things for you, to have compassion on you. Rather, you were thrown out into the open field, for you were abhorred on the day you were born. Verse 6. When I passed by you, this is God passing by his covenant people. When I passed by you and I saw you squirming in your blood, I said to you while you were in your blood, live! Yes, I said to you while you were in your blood, live! I made you numerous like plants of the field. Then you grew up, became tall, and reached the age for fine enormous. Your breasts were formed and your hair had grown, yet you were naked and bare. Then I passed by you and saw you, and behold, you are the time for love. So I spread my skirt over you and covered your nakedness. This is the kind of covenant love that God has for his own. I also swore to you and entered into a covenant with you, so that you became mine, declares the Lord. Verse 9, Then I bathed you with water, washed off your blood from, your, from you, and anointed you with oil. I also clothed you with, with embroidered cloth and put sandals of purpose skin on your feet, and I wrapped you with fine linen and, and covered you with silk. I adorned you with, or, with ornaments, put braces on your hands and necklace around your neck. This is the Samurite. This is the ancient world beauty, king, kingly beauty. Verse 12, I put a ring in your nostril, earrings in your ears, and a beautiful crown on your head. There, thus you were adorned with gold and silver, and your dress was of fine linen, silk, and embroidered cloth. You ate fine flour, honey, and oil, so you were exceedingly beautiful and advanced to royalty. God loves his own. Verse 14, Then your fame went forth among the nations on account of your beauty. For it was perfect because of my splendor which I bestowed on you, declares the Lord God. Verse 15 describes to us the fall of God's covenant people, the fall of the nation. But you trusted in your beauty and played the harlot because of your fame. And you poured out your harlot tree and every passerby who might be willing. You took some of your cloths and made for yourself a high places of various colors and played the harlot on them. Which should never come nor happen. And here we now he goes on and on talks about the evilness of Israel. He talks about how Israel played the harlot. How Israel... Went on. In verse 25, he says, And it came after all your wickedness. Woe, woe to you, declares the Lord God. You built yourself a high place. You worship multiple gods. And he goes on to talk about you play the harlot with the Egyptian, your lustful neighbors, and multiplied your harlotry. He talks about the, the evilness and wickedness so bad that in verse 47, he says that Sodom was better than you. You acted more corruptly than they. Sodom, your sister and your daughters have not done as you and your daughters have done. And Sodom is far worse than you. But then he chastened them. He chastened them like a father chastens his son. And in verse 60, God says, Nevertheless, Nevertheless, I will remember my covenant with you in the days of your youth. I will establish an everlasting covenant with you. Then you will remember your ways and be shamed when you receive your sisters, both your older and younger, and I will give them to you as daughters. He's going to forgive all of them, and in that forgiveness, he will be glorified. And through that glory, you will be humbled. Verse 63, so that you may remember and be ashamed and never open your mouth anymore because of your humiliation. Then I have forgiven you for all that you've done. The Lord God declares. This love is unbreakable, unshakable, strong, and will carry through through the end. God indeed loves his own. John chapter 13, currently John chapter 13 verse 14 says this, I will dash them against each other 
Listen and give heed, do not be haughty. Give glory to the God who brings you out of darkness, and before your feet stumble on dusky mountains, and while you're hoping for light, he makes into deep darkness. In verse 17, listen, listen, listen to this. Listen, God, if the people who do not turn from their wicked ways, this isn't how God responds to them. But if you will not listen to me, if you will not heed my voice, this is God talking now, my soul will sob in secret. God will cry in his heart. And my eyes will bitterly weep and flow down with tears because a flock of the Lord has been captive. This kind of love is a kind of love where God cannot take it from you. Do not love him. He flows. He will sob in secret. His eyes will be bitterly leap. He will flow down with tears. Until. I mean, we all remember the vivid picture of that in Luke. When Jesus stands before Jerusalem. And says oh Jerusalem. Jerusalem how long to gather like chicks. Gathers her tens. The psalmist said, Give thanks to the God of heaven. His love endures forever. And in John it says, As a father has loved me, so have I loved you. Remain in my love. If you keep my commands, you remain in my love, just as I've kept my father's commandments. You remain in my love, just as I've kept my fight and remain in his love. I have told you this so that you may, so that my joy May be in you, and that your joy may be complete. My my command is this: love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. Instead, I have called you friends, but for everything that I have learned from the Father, I have given to you. And made known to you. you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you so that you may go and bear fruit. This is my command love each other as I have loved you. Wow. Perfect love, perfect harmony. God has for his own. And to wrap this sermon up, I would like to end with John chapter 17. And I want you to listen very closely to Jesus' love he has for his own. John chapter 17 says this. Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that the Son may glorify you, even as you gave him authority over all flesh, that, that to all whom you have given him, he may give eternal life. This is love. This is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, in Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. I have glorified you on the earth, having accomplished the work which you have given me to do now, Father. Glorify me together with yourself with the glory which I had with you before the world was. I have manifested your name to the men whom you gave me out of the world. They were yours, and you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Now they have come to know that everything you have given me is from you, for the words which you gave me I have given to, the, given to them. And they received them, and truly understood that I came forth from you. And they believe that you sent me. I ask on behalf of the world, but but of those whom you have given me, for they are yours. And all things that are mine are yours, and yours are mine, and I have been glorified in them. Watch this. This is the unbreakable love. I am no longer in the world, yet they themselves are in the world. Watch this. Holy Father, keep them in your name, the name which you have given me. While I was with them, I was keeping them in your name, which you have given me, and I guarded them, and not one of them perished. But the son of perdition said that the scripture would be fulfilled. But now I come to you, and these things I speak to the world, so that they may have my joy made full in themselves. 
I have given them your world and the world that is hated them, for they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. O righteous Father, although the world has not known you, yet I have known you, and these have known that you have sent me. I have made your name known to them, and I will continue to make it known to them, to the love, mm -hmm. so that the love with which you loved me may be in them, and I in them.